Welcome to The Big L, your unofficial source for Libertarian Party news, arcana, and information for the liberty-minded political junkie. Find us at BigLPodcast.com. Here's your host, Libertarian Party insider and the pink flame of liberty, Karen Ann Harlos. Well, hello, everyone. This may be, in fact, the episode that you have been waiting for, or as I said on Face Beast, I don't think you're ready for this jelly, but here you go. It's entitled From Apathy to Anarchy, Why I Am an Anarchist, What That Means, and Why You Should Be One Too. This subject comes up often and hard, and one that I am sure I will be addressing in many ways from many angles over, hopefully, our long time together. But before we get started, I would like to make some needed recognitions and thank yous. Thank you to the Patreon supporters of this show. Silver patron Tom Knapp with his heart of gold. Gold patrons David Jeffries and Catherine Iverson. And a huge thank you to Catherine for the fantastic cartoon she drew of me. I'll throw it up into the Patreon feed so you can you can take a look at it. I'm completely over the moon about it, and I'll be using it in my YouTube channel. And executive producer Ken Bates. I wish I could somehow show how absolutely insane my life is. And like the small miracle it is that really anything comes together because I'm doing a million gazillion things at once. And With it now being 2019 and another year older, I am not a spring chicken, I would like to devote more focused effort to liberty. But in order to do that, I need to be able to support myself, at least partially with this work. I have a goal of getting to $200 a month in patrons for this podcast by the end of March. So I ask you humbly if you would please consider becoming a patron and living the reality of the voluntary, no such thing as IP, community at work. Also, iTunes and other podcatcher reviews are always appreciated, and a shout out to the new reviews since my last mention. First up, Herman Hu said, Karen is fun to listen to. Go into the depth of the history of the Libertarian Party. I especially love her fun sound effects as well as her take on all the inside baseball. Definitely a one of a kind look at the Libertarian Party and a all caps must listen. Herman, you get me. Very few people get me. Be afraid. It's, it's not normal. Yes, I am the one who asked, hey, Siri, well, let's see if we can do it right now. Hey, Siri, what's the difference between a duck? One leg is both the same. See, Siri gets me too. Also, next on the iTunes reviews, Cray de Bell, who is Catherine Iverson, previously mentioned the artist, and this is what she said. We, the newbies of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of the omnipotent state. No, she didn't say that part. She said she did say the newbies of the Libertarian Party, but she then she went on to say, do humbly thank Karen Ann Harlos for teaching us the history of our party. No, but seriously, I have thoroughly enjoyed learning more about the statement of principles I read over and over and over before deciding to sign my name to it. I never sign my name lightly, you see. Joining the party to me means dedicating myself to its success. But how do I keep from repeating the mistakes of the past if I do not know our history? My fifth grade teacher used to push his glasses up his nose with his middle finger and taught us to read between the lines, which is hilarious, and that history is written by the victors. I am enjoying the honesty and thoroughness of your telling of events, and it has the same ring of truth and critical thought that I got from him all those years ago. I'm not wealthy yet, but here's why I decided to become a patron today. You have provided something I find valuable and worth perpetrating. When I was a little girl watching Red Dwarf Marathons on PBS, I thought I might do that someday. But here we are fighting for a world set free in our lifetime. Thank you so much, Catherine. I could say thank you a million times and that wouldn't be sufficient. 
Also, for your guys' knowledge, um, this episode will be produced in video form for my YouTube channel, Pink Flame of Liberty, as well, in case you want to see it in a Another format. As I said, you know, I know some of you out there are twisted and just can't get enough. So now back to the topic at hand. The year is 2014. The place is suburban Castle Rock, Colorado. And our subject is a middle aged paralegal, newly remarried and starting a new life in a new state after pulling up roots from everything she's known and taking a chance for personal freedom. As I mentioned in one of the first podcasts, I became a libertarian quite unexpectedly, literally over the course of a lunch hour. I was not political. I had stopped voting some time ago, so getting politically involved was the last thing on my mind, perhaps only outranked by spleen worms. But I am always curious for knowledge. And after using the term libertarian and realizing that I only knew what it meant in a theological sense, so in a soteriological context rather than a political one, I looked up lp.org and everything changed. At that moment, I would have described myself as a small government constitutionalist. America and apple pie and these colors don't run. And thank you, sir, for your service. The whole bit. And while I might have cared about who ended up running the state apparatus, I had never really questioned the legitimacy or need for the state apparatus at all. I just preferred my team, even though I was apolitical, I still had some leanings as I wasn't that icky, sticky, ooey gooey liberal. So as long as one of them didn't, you know, didn't have the ball, I was fine. And as you know, I then read the platform and things once seen can never be unseen. I have previously given more than a full exposition about my torrid love affair with the Statement of Principles, but it was not just the Statement of Principles that grabbed my heart, since it is not the first thing you read when you read the platform, though it should be, damn it, but the preamble is. Was part of a love song to my soul and summed up for me my freedom, you know, what, what I was running away from and running to in this new life of mine. And as libertarians, we seek a world of liberty, a world in which all individuals are sovereign over their own lives and are not forced to sacrifice their values for the benefit of others. We believe that respect for individual rights is the essential precondition for a free and prosperous world, that force and fraud must be banished from human relationships, and that only through freedom can peace and prosperity be realized. Consequently, we defend each person's right to engage in any activity that is peaceful and honest and welcome the diversity that freedom brings. The world we seek to build is one where individuals are free to follow their own dreams in their own ways without interference from government or any authoritarian power. In the following pages, we set forth our basic principles and enumerate various policy strands, or as it stands, eh, same thing, derived from those principles. These specific policies are not our goal, however. Our goal is nothing more nor less than a world set free in our lifetime, and it is to this end that we take these stands. Now, I know this is all old news to you, but now we can pick it up from here. How did I get from there to here? I grokked the issue of limited, I mean truly limited government right away, actual menarchy, and nearly immediately shed my small government constitutionalist skin for a menarchist one, completely bypassing the typical classical liberal phase. Even though when I took the Kaplan libertarian purity test, for which there will be a link in the show notes, I scored in the 80s as a respectable, moderate libertarian, and I was perfectly comfortable being there. And 
that is where I thought I would stay. It began then to amaze me how few actual minarchists are in this quote unquote minarchist party. And I think that explains the over the top angsty navel gazing that happens so often. For instance, when we published a, a post last week or a few, yeah, about last week. And when you guys hear this, it'll probably be about last week where it said legalize recreational cocaine and some libertarians lost their mind. That is our platform, folks. Oh, what I wouldn't give for the party to be made up of actual majority minarchists. But what do I mean by that term? Since most party members probably consider themselves minarchists and in reality are not. This means that the state is extraordinarily limited only to the enforcement and protection of rights. And that's it. Roads? Nope. Except perhaps to have a uniform safety code. Schools? Definitely not. Healthcare? Uh, shut up! And we do not take these positions to be edgy or cool. It is because of foundational principle. There is a logic and reason to these positions, and they stem from the libertarian understanding of rights. We will surely discuss this issue of rights many times, but for now, it is necessary to at least basically define what libertarians mean by rights, since that term is pillaged today. And that means we need to understand the concept of negative rights and positive rights, or another way to put it, liberties and entitlements. I will put a link in the show notes to a short but very good uh, explanation of these from Learn Liberty. Now, these terms tend to confuse people with a value judgment of good and bad, but positive and negative is a philosophical categorization, not a moral one. And we see that everything in the Libertarian Party philosophy is grounded upon a theory of rights that we need to understand. For instance, it's demonstrated in these platform statements. We believe that respect for individual rights is the essential precondition for a free and prosperous world. That was from the preamble, where it is basically stating that these rights are a necessary condition for human flourishing, basically. Notice, though, it made no claim that those alone are sufficient, merely that they are necessary. We could get into that at another time on how I think it is entirely possible to have a perfectly libertarian society that is still a dystopian nightmare. If you don't believe me, just go and read Hans Hermann Hoppe. Or is it Hoppe? I don't care. His fans get really upset with me because I don't pronounce the name right. So I just look at him and go, hippity hoppity, get off my property. Continuing, the Statement of Principles also says, We, the members of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of the omnipotent state and defend the rights of the individual. We hold that all individuals have the right to exercise sole dominion over their own lives and have the right to live in whatever manner they choose, so long as they do not forcibly interfere with the equal right of others to live in whatever manner they choose. Notice the emphasis on rights over and over. And despite the attempts by some to obfuscate this fact, the LP philosophy is not a utilitarian rights view. It is a deontological natural rights view. You can ignore the fancy pants terms and just think of it this way. And this is reading directly from the platform. Libertarians embrace the concept that all people are born with certain inherent rights. Notice it, it, it just it presumes them from the beginning. The utility of such rights is irrelevant at that point. So now back to defining negative rights or liberties and positive rights or entitlements. A negative right is your freedom to do any peaceful thing without forceful interference by others. 
No one has to help you or do anything else for you to fulfill this right. The only thing that others owe you is passive non-aggression. A positive right is something that requires others to do something for you. This imposes an active duty on others, unlike the passive duty of negative rights. You might be thinking at this point, that's all nice, but what the flip does this have to do with your road to anarchy? Patience, Padawan. We're getting there. So let's read that platform statement again, and I'm going to follow with the sentence that came right after. So it's libertarians embrace the concept that all people are born with certain inherent rights. We reject the idea that a natural right can ever impose an obligation upon others to fulfill that right. That is about as clear of a statement of negative natural rights as you can get. But let me give you some examples so so that we're on the same page here that you're so that you're catching what I'm throwing. You have a right to life. Your right to life though imposes no obligation upon me other than I don't actively try to kill you. It does not mean that I have to house you, feed you, clothe you or otherwise sustain you. I can choose to do any of those things, but you have no enforceable right to demand it of me. Most of what we hear today of rights are actually positive rights, such as the alleged right to health care. For that quote unquote right to exist, it requires others to actively do things for you above and beyond not interfering with you freely seeking health care from willing providers. So let's visualize our libertarian Adam, a new creation made out of the soil of Libertopia. Until he voluntarily assumes some duty, there are no enforceable claims of a positive right against him or for him. So in this state of nature, virgin state of nature, libertarians absolutely deny the existence of inherent positive rights. There are none. But we don't deny the existence of positive rights in total, since that would interfere with your negative right to voluntarily assume a duty, which you do every time that you enter into a contract, for instance. So you arrogate these to yourself by your voluntary exercise of your negative rights. Now, I'm going to take a sip of my, my the, the food of the gods here, diet do. I know there's a minarchist like me, or like former me, listening, that is about this time getting a sick feeling in their stomach because they're starting to see where I'm going. The way I'm going to connect some dots that are usually breezed past in the tracks covered over. I do think it is the elephant in the libertarian living room. Let's read another platform statement. No individual group or government may rightly initiate force against any other individual group or government. Libertarians reject the notion that groups have inherent rights. We support the rights of the smallest minority, the individual. So only individual negative rights are both inherent and enforceable. This is self ownership and your right to defend your self-ownership against those who would use force to compel you to do something as an entitlement to them. So in this very simplified discussion, we have certain societal options to consider. But before we do, there's another round of clarification that is in order. I am a libertarian anarchist. I am anti-state, but I am not anti-government. In fact, I personally favor quite a bit of government. Does that surprise you? If it does, it's because we have melded terms. We've conflated them. The state is not equivalent to government. The state is a type of government, but not the only type. All states govern, but not all governments are states. So what, in fact, is a state? 
It is an entity that holds a monopoly on the justified enforcement of certain rules or laws in a given geographical area. So what are the societal options we can consider? We have statism, which is every government pretty much in the world today where the government initiates force against people against their natural negative rights and self-ownership. An option which doesn't currently exist is minarchism. And word to your mama, right? W- word to my fellow anarchists, it is ridiculously pedantic to call minarchism statism. Cut it out. Don't be the dumb. All right. Minarchism, which still maintains a territorial monopoly on rights protection, but its adherents maintain, even if I might dispute it, that it does not initiate the use or threat of physical force. Alternatively, there is what I hold, libertarian anarchy, in which there are no enforced monopolies on anything, including rights protection and enforcement, but it is all dealt with in the free market of voluntary exchange. In this way, it isn't really another system. It is a non-system predicated on a naked respect for negative rights. Now, I'm going to lead you to how I got from there to here. And later on, after I'd come to these conclusions, I found an essay by Roy Childs in a letter he wrote to Ayn Rand that pretty much came to the exact same conclusions I did, but obviously in a much more eloquent and learned way. And that deeply encouraged me because, as I said often, I'm a bear of little brain, and if I'm the first person to come to some conclusion and no one else has, it's probably wrong. So it was a good confirmation that I was on the right track. I will put a link to that essay also in the show notes. So most libertarians claim to hold to minarchism, though, as they they don't actually, as I said before, but even actual minarchists are trying to square a circle. It's impossible. Why? Because a minarchist state must initiate force or stop being a state. Let me explain. A minarchist state claims a monopoly on rights enforcement. And not just a monopoly, but an enforced monopoly. And it's just not open to competition. A state has no rights. It can only claim to enforce the rights of individuals, which means that it is assuming a right that an individual has. The right to defense of my own rights vests in me. And that right includes the how or the if of it. So what happens if I am not happy with the service of this enforced monopoly in the way it protects my rights? Can I simply go to a competitor without leaving my justly owned property, without hearing cries of move to Somalia? Can I set up a competing enforcement service? What happens if I do? In that case, The minarchist state has two options. It can allow the competition, in which case it ceases to be a territorial monopoly and transforms itself into just another market player, the free market, or it can use force to shut down any competitor, which would then be violating my rights to self-defense and choice and be assuming upon itself the enforcement of my rights when I refuse to subrogate it to them. Ergo, if you consistently hold to the libertarian theory of rights that there are no unassumed positive rights to you or from you, a minarchy is incompatible as it forces me to use its services for something that I have an inherent right of, to determine of, and 
It can only do that with my permission. And it does, if it no longer has my permission because it has no rights in and of itself. And it also forces me to provide it to other people. Since in a minarchist society, inevitably defense is a positive right. Now, how would all this work in libertarian anarchy is a separate question. Perhaps it wouldn't. That doesn't make the rights violation justified even if you think it is necessary. But then you have turned into a utilitarian, and I warn you, there are no brakes on that thing. El caro en tornado, todos son caminos. I do not believe in the initiation of force to achieve social or political goals, including rights enforcement. Again, I can hear the shrieking, Ree! this won't work. Ree! So what? Expediency makes things right. The ends justify the means. Either violating rights is inherently just or it isn't. This is an ontological question, not a praxological one. So why don't we see how close we can get? Because we do this in nearly everything else. We strive every day for the impossible. We condemn murder and rape as wrong, but we accept they will never be perfectly eliminated. So I would say, if you are going to advocate for force, face it head on. Don't perfume the hog. And you personally be willing to commit aggression against anyone simply wanting sovereignty over their own rights. And if you can't do that, don't ask a state to do it for you. I am also going to leave in the show notes an article by Stefan Kinsella, The Irrelevance of the Impossibility of Anarcho-Libertarianism. It was that article in which I finally realized that I was an anarchist, and I probably had been for some time, but the, that connected all the dots for me. Now, this also will be a two-parter. I'm not immediately recording part two, but I will probably do it over the next few days. So patrons will be able to listen to it first. And what, pray tell, will that cover? That will cover the fact that although I am a libertarian anarchist, and I do think that is the consistent application of libertarian principles, and you have every right to be wrong, it doesn't fucking matter right now. Get over it. Work together. All right. I look forward forward to chatting with you further in the future. Have an awesome night. Mi guapas de libertad. Thank you for listening to The Big L, where size does matter. Subscribe today and help support the show by going to BigLPodcast.com. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast. I must take this time to disseminate the appropriate disclaimers and advisories. If it pleases the crown... While I am an officer of the National Libertarian Party and have in fact sold my soul to the blessed chicken on a stick, <laughs> all opinions, perspectives, rants, jokes, and outbursts of any and all kinds are solely me speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the party. I am not the party spokesperson, just a fanatic who happens to hold a position. Before anything else, I am a liberty activist, just like you. And if you call me a politician, I die a little inside. Thank you.